Hi, everybody. The um, purpose of this lecture is to finish up our discussion of the Umfakane, uh, and specifically to talk about um, kind of the uh, interventions that the Europeans make uh, and the African reactions to that. Um, and uh, hopefully, at the end of this, we will finally have this complex puzzle put together and, and uh, be able to understand uh, kind of the sequence of events that completely transformed South Africa uh, in the early to, to mid 19th century. Um, and to do this, we have to go back and pick up something we talked about already, and that is the Great Trek. If we recall, uh, these uh, Afrikaners living here in um, the eastern part of the Cape uh, in the early 19th century were not necessarily thrilled um, with being under the, the thumb, under the rule of the British. Um, they were particularly concerned about British policies toward uh, slavery, um, the, the opposition to slavery, um, British friendliness to African rights and African interests, and, and uh, they saw this as not only uh, threatening to the kind of society they had set up, but, but offensive to God uh, in the Dutch Reformed Church, which was the dominant uh, religious sect uh, of the Afrikaners. Um, you know, this had become a tenet of the faith that, that white and black people were fundamentally different and, and should not be uh, uh, acknowledged as equals uh, in, you know, before God or men. Um, and, you know, so this was deeply offensive to them. Um, and for any those and, and uh, several more reasons, um, these Afrikaners set off on this pioneering trek with their covered wagons um, across the Drakensberg Escarpment up into um, into uh, the area north of the Orange River. Uh, some of them went further than that and crossed the Fall River, and, and some of them, as we'll see, would eventually come down into uh, the area of Natal. Um, they did this not as an organized group. Now, then, in other words, there was not a single company or a single organization planning uh, the Great Trek. Instead, this was done mostly in kinship groups. These are called Trek parties. They were headed by um, uh, sort of family heads uh, or you know, the heads of, uh, of large uh, groups of relations. Um, uh, and these are some of the most famous uh, figures in, in Afrikaner history. Uh, there are many, you know, when I was living in South Africa 25 years ago, at least, there were many streets named after these guys. Um, names like uh, Piet Retief and um, Garrett uh, Meritz um, and uh, Andreas, uh, uh, Andres Hendrik uh, Pokiter. Um, and so forth and so on. I mean, these were these are some of the heroes of Afrikaner history, right? Um, uh, but they operated independently of each other, and they tended to settle kind of uh, at a remove from each other. And so, you know, um, some of them decided to go one place, some decided to go another place. Um, so they weren't always united in this, and that was going to have that 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 was going to have consequences for the kind of the the immediate future of uh, Afrikaner history. Um, in the, uh, the the Fall River region, they ran into the Indebele, and if we recall, the Indebele had um, uh, been driven out of the area east of the Drakensberg by the the Zulu Empire, had settled up here in this area. Um, they were led by a guy named Mzili Kazi, uh, and the Indebele had were quite aggressive. They had attacked um, the Tswana people and the Sutu people uh, living in this area. Uh, over here to the east, we have the Griqua, who had kind of uh, formed um, their own societies and their own governments there, and, and they were also threatened by the Indebele. Uh, and so the Indebele, when the when these uh, you know white Afrikaners uh, crossed into their region, um, they decided to attack them, um, and uh, you know there were tense relations between them. Um, but ultimately, the uh, well, initially the Indebele had some success at doing this, but uh, as it happened in, in many other cases, uh, the Afrikaners counterattacked and raided the food stores, food supplies, um, even you know, sort of took the war to the women and children. Um, and the Indebele had done the same uh, in attacking these family groups. Um, and ultimately the Afrikaners drove the Indebele out of the Fall River region. Um, in fact, all the way to the north up here, across the Limpopo River. Uh, and this area here became known ultimately as Matabele land. Uh, it had been populated um, previous to that time uh, by various groups. Uh, the dominant among the groups in that area were the uh, Shona, 
uh, but also the Venda and the Tsonga uh, lived up close to the Limpopo River. The Indivele, um, uh sort of scattered them, drove the, the Shona to the north, um, and set up their their government and their new society there in this in this new Matabele land. Uh, so this is just further kind of fallout, you know, from the Umfakane. Now, some uh, of these fortrekkers decided to remain uh, west of the Drakensberg escarpment. Um, the the dominant figure among them was uh, uh, Hendrik Pokiter, um, uh, but the groups led by Gerrit Meritz and uh, Piet Retief um, uh, decided to move to the east, cross the mountains, and go down into um, the area around the Tugela River, which had, um, uh, that's this river right here, okay, um, uh, and also the Intoma River, which is a branch of the Tugela River, I believe. Um, uh, this was better farmland. There was higher rainfall there. Um, some of the best farmland in all of South Africa um, was there, and so this attracted these four trekkers. But of course, it brought them into the orbit of the Zulu, um, who were still very aggressive uh, under under Dingane. Um, and uh, they initially tried to make a treaty with Dingane. Dingane seemed friendly to this, but uh, Dingane himself decided that the Afrikaners were um, probably not to be um, trifled with or, or even um, uh, parlayed with. And, uh, you know, after these initial forays into diplomacy, Dingane decided to attack them. And um, uh, in the first instance, um, the uh, the Zulu were well successful. This is in eighteen uh, early eighteen thirty eight. Um, the Zulu attacked uh, the four trekker group led by Pete Retief and nearly wiped them out. Um, they killed hundreds of them, uh, including uh, the this four trekker group had like the others um, had gathered together a number of the Griqua um, who were their servants. Uh, they so they they killed uh, large numbers of these whites as well as the coloreds um, or the Griqua, um, and uh, this was a real slaughter. Um, in one of the assigned uh, primary sources in the Williams book, um, this is uh, part two, section B, document four. Um, there was a missionary named Francis Owen, a British missionary who had traveled to the uh, court of Dingane. Um, Dingane ended up employing him as a kind of secretary. Owen did not have a lot of success in trying to convert the Zulu to Christianity. And, and uh, just a couple months after this, uh, the events recounted in this document, he gave up um, and uh, went and left and went back to England, um, feeling that he had no uh, hope of converting the Zulu to Christianity. In any case, Owen um, gives a description of this massacre. And one part of this that I wanted to just point out is on the toward the bottom of page 95. It's um, Owen's take on all of this, how he, you know, interprets the Zulu actions and uh, decides whether they're justified or not. And in his view, they're not, right? This is, uh, um, this is just an act of savagery. Uh, he says, Dingarn, that's the the, the way that he pronounces Dingane. Uh, Dingarn's conduct was worthy of a savage as he is. It was base and treacherous, to say the least of it, the offspring of cowardice and fear, suspicious of his warlike neighbors, jealous of their power, dreading the neighborhood of their arms. He felt, as every savage would have done in like circumstances, that these men were his enemies, and being unable to attack them openly, he massacred them clandestinely. Right? Um... And so Owen finds this abhorrent. Um, Owen, of course, is not uh, reckoning with the fact that the um, uh, the Afrikaners, the Trek Boers, had for generations at this point uh, committed similar massacres against um, various African groups, um, and you know had slaughtered their their women and children uh, and their elderly, in addition to the warriors, um, had often done and had you know raided their food stores, taken their cattle, uh, left them starving. Um, you know, I mean, this was uh, sort of tit for tat, and this is not to say that this is totally justified by any means, right? But um, this is a very, as these many of these documents are, the very Eurocentric view of the whole thing. Um, the Afrikaners then 
uh, in a way, counterattacked. They set up a military encampment here um, at the headwaters of the, uh, well, this is the Ntome River. Um, that's this word right here, Ntome. Uh, this became known uh, in European circles as the Battle of Blood River. Um, uh, and this was a massacre of the Zulu. Now, uh, this is one of the more famous battles in South African history. Um, so there was a company of these Afrikaners. Uh, they had lots of guns and ammunition. They had a couple of cannons. And they essentially set up a defensive position by lashing their wagons together. Uh, Dingane, in an attempt to rid them from his land forever, sent about 10,000 warriors to attack them. The Afrikaners, by contrast, had just a few hundred men. Um, but uh, wave after wave of Zulu attack, and this happened um, over the course of, uh, of a night, um, wave after wave of a Zulu attack was repulsed by the guns and cannons of these Afrikaners. Uh, at the end of the battle, about 3,000 Zulus uh, lay dead on the battlefield. Um, the Afrikaners, uh, at least by the accounts we have, had not lost a single uh, person in the fight. Um, there, you know, this is one case where the, su the superior technology of the Europeans made a huge difference. Um, now, you know, the Zulu would go on to be successful later against European armies. This is not, you know, indicative of uh, of every um, uh, encounter between the Africans and the Europeans. But in this case, the Zulu suffered a really stinging defeat and lost thousands of warriors. And this led some of the um, uh, Zulus to decide that collaborating with the Europeans was their was in their best interest. Uh, a rival to Dingane, whose name was Mpande, um, this is in fact his brother, I believe, um, decided to collaborate with the Europeans uh, and together with a group of Afrikaner commandos, he attacked Dingane. Uh, Dingane um, lost the battle, fled the battlefield, went north where he was killed by the Swazi. Um, and so the guy who had, you know, the the half-brother who had killed uh, Shaka was now killed himself in rather treacherous ways. Uh, and Mpande then assumed the mantle of leadership, though in, in cooperation to some extent with, um, with the Afrikaners. With the death of Dingane, uh, there was a perception that the Zulu Empire was now um, weakened, um, and it's probably accurate. Uh, and so many of these Ngoni uh, who had fled from Natal uh, because of the predations of Shaka and Dingane, uh, then flooded back into Natal. And this created more of a problem for the Afrikaners than the, the Zulu warriors had. They're, they were just outnumbered by orders of magnitude, right? There were only a few thousand of the Afrikaners there. Uh, there were you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, um, of these, uh, these Africans living there. Um, and, uh, you know, they, the Fortrekkers uh, decided to set up um, a government in, in Natal based in a, t a settlement that they came to call Peter Meritzburg. Um, this is named after Pete Retief and, and Garrett Meritz. Um, uh, it's just to the woods about right here on the map. Okay. Um, and... Uh, they created a, a government um, and a, a kind of constitution um, or at least principles of government, um, and among this, uh, among these were, of course, uh, the strict separation um, of white and black, and uh, you know the refusal to acknowledge any any sort of civil or political rights for black people. Um, many of the leaders of this uh, kind of burgeoning um, uh, republic uh, never fully reached that status, but uh, you know they were determined to. Um, try to force these Africans to migrate out of this territory. Um, uh, but, you know, the sheer numbers of these Africans really kind of forced their hand and, and made their lives uh, uncomfortable, okay? Um, they enslaved a lot of them. Uh, it became an Afrikaner habit, uh, as it had been with the Trek Boers, to raid uh, African settlements, to... Um, to abscond with their children, uh, to turn them into slaves, um, and uh, you know this this became pretty standard policy, um, and for a number of reasons, um, you know the British uh, sensing that the Afrikaners were were 
getting involved in slavery again, um, also due to the appeals of Mpande and later his son Tachwayo, um, the, the British uh, decided uh, ultimately to annex Natal. And there's, there's a good deal more, it's more complicated than that, right? I mean, this wasn't just a spur of the moment decision. This is something that um, uh, took a lot of thinking, a lot of debates. Uh, the British were not necessarily involved, uh, interested, many of them at least, in, in um, extending their colonial possessions in South Africa. They still haven't, you know, I mean, this was still not a terribly valuable colony for them. Um, but uh, due to a number of factors, they decided to annex Natal. Um, and that combined with uh, the, the problem of simply being out outnumbered uh, exponentially by the Africans led most of these Afrikaners then to trek back across the Drakensberg. Um, only a few thousand remained in Natal uh, where they would be outnumbered by uh, an influx of, well, not only by Africans, but by a, uh, a an influx of British settlers uh, who were incentivized to come to Natal. Um, now, the British government in Natal, uh, and you know, there's some, as I said, there's some settlements. Um, uh, one point that uh, I would encourage you to pay attention to in the reading um, is this relationship between the Zulu king. Mpande um, died, uh, what, in the I think eight, uh, 1860s, something like that. Um, and uh, his son, Tachwayo, uh, replaced him as king. But there was there's a really interesting relationship between Tachwayo and the, um, the Natal official, uh, British official for native affairs, whose name was Theophilus Shepstone. Shepstone is one of the more interesting personalities in all of 19th century South Africa. Um, he was raised in South Africa, um, learned to speak Nguni languages. Uh, he was uh, fluent in Kosa and in Zulu, I believe, um, and had a view of how to work with the native peoples um, that ran counter to many of the Europeans. This is not to say that he was um, necessarily more friendly to the Africans. He was very paternalistic, um, very much a proponent of, uh, of indirect rule with strict supervision of, um, uh, of colonial officials. But he did, as a result of learning their language and spending a lot of time around them, uh, come to appreciate uh, or at least know a lot about the society and culture of the Zulu people. Uh, uh, and he became a personal friend of Tachuayo. Um, Shepstone wrote uh, a, a fair amount about the Zulu, about their customs, about their culture. Um, he's an important source for uh, the Zulu in this period. Um, and all of chapter three of Hamilton's book, Terrific Majesty, the, the monograph you're supposed to read for this week, deals with um, Shepstone and his manipulation of the persona of Shaka Zulu. Okay. Um, he, for instance, presided over the installation of Taichuayo after his father Mpande died uh, as king. But in doing so, he adopted the persona of Shaka himself, right? At the ceremony where Taichuayo was crowned king, Shepstone acted as Shaka, as the one who presided over this, and even as the one, you know, from whom the authority of the Zulu king issued. Um, and all of this was a, an interesting, as I said, manipulation of Zulu customs that came from uh, a pretty close understanding of it, right? Um, so, you know, uh, Shepstone is a, a unique personality. Um, he felt that Africans should be left to develop on their own, even though he, you know, was interested in, in providing education for them. He didn't necessarily um, see that leading to uh, the destruction of African cultures. Um, but at the same time, he was very paternalistic and saw himself as the, um, you know, the kind of puppet master, as it were, of all of these African chiefs. Um, the, the British, uh, and especially with this new influx of British settlers, the, the British um, were just as concerned in their own way 
with uh, the numbers game, with the, you know, the, the demographics of being um, severely outnumbered by the Africans. Um, and so they set up a policy of establishing these things called locations. Uh, similar to the Native American reservations, um, that word would continue to be used in South African history to describe uh, some of the structures of apartheid. Um, I worked in what many South Africans called locations when I was uh, uh, in, in South Africa. Um, these are also called townships. Um, but uh, these reserves where the Africans uh, could live and, and have self-government with the sort of paternalistic supervision of Europeans. Um, because uh, people like Shepstone, um, you know, felt that it was important for the Africans to have their own governments uh, and to develop in their own ways, um, the British were often wanting for labor, right? They, they, they didn't necessarily employ Africans. Uh, this wasn't part of their policy. Or they didn't think it was even a very good idea. And so to provide uh, a lot of the menial labor, uh, the tasks that the settlers didn't necessarily want to do, they imported thousands of Indian immigrants, right? So Natal came to have a large Indian population. And by this, I mean people from India, right? Um, uh, and that demographic would remain a factor in Natal all the way through, well, all the way to the present, in fact, right? Um, there have always been a lot of Indians from, from the mid 19th century on, uh, in the eastern part of South Africa. The Afrikaners, uh, some of whom had remained in the High Felds uh, west of the Drakensberg, uh, some of whom had gone on their venture in Natal only to return, end up, ended up um, establishing two republics. Uh, this one here was called the Orange Free State. Uh, the one up here was called the South African Republic, but uh, colloquially came to be called the Transvaal. Um, and they operated somewhat differently from each other. They both had a legislature, which they called the Volksrad. Um, uh, the Orange Free State had uh, a more efficient and um, uh, kind of comprehensible constitution. Uh, the uh, the Transvaal had a constitution that had something like 220 articles in it, something like that. I mean, it was just very unwieldy, uh, dealing often with very specific things. Uh, but one of the commonalities, despite you know, in addition to both having a, a kind of unicameral legislature, um, was that uh, both of these had very strict policies, uh, laws, in fact, um, governing the relations between the races, right, um, and. The long and short of it was whites had political rights uh, and blacks did not. Um, blacks were not, you know, they didn't have the right to vote. They, they could not be represented. Um, they uh, did not have property rights. Um, uh, and so this was, you know, inevitably going to lead to clashes. Um, and, it, and it would, right? This um, area becomes the, the scene of some of the greatest violence uh, between black and whites uh, for the next century and a half. Um, um, and there's a lot more to those, uh, really, than, than you know than we have time to talk about. Um, but uh, this is what the South African map looks like, uh, you know, at the end, or rather, by about 1870 or so. Okay. The last part of this, and I, I said I would pick up um, this thread in an earlier lecture. Um, if we recall, uh, King Mushwechwe um, had uh, gathered together. Uh, mostly Sutu people, but, you know, including some refugees in a kingdom that he established here between the Caledon River Valley and uh, the, the kind of the highest peaks of the Drakensberg Mountains, um, with a capital at Tababusiu, uh, which was just here, um, sort of on the, the verge between the mountains and, and the valley there. Um, well, in the 1860s, uh, the Orange Free State uh, Afrikaners, um, seeing that some of the best farmland in their territory was in the Caledon River Valley, ended up settling there. The Sutu fought against them. Uh, the Afrikaners uh, united together and uh, attacked uh, Sutu positions, even um, just were close to raiding Tababosiu itself, which is a, you know, a, a fairly well fortified um, settlement. Um, uh, one of uh, Moshwechwe's sons, um, Mpondo, I think was his name, um, ended up surrendering to the Afrikaners, and uh, they forced um, 
Moshe Shwe to hand over a lot of the territory, including pretty much all of the Caledon River Valley, the, the good farmland, uh, to the Afrikaners. Uh, and he was near to um, handing over the vast majority of his kingdom to them uh, simply to maintain peace or to, to achieve peace again. When, for a variety of reasons, the British decided to annex Basutu land, as they, they came to call it, right, and to form a colony there. Um, and uh, this is, um, th there's a complex thought process that went into this. Uh, you know, the, um, the British were not necessarily interested, just as, as had been the case with Natal, interested in, in um, you know, claiming another colony, um, but, you know, it was partly the kind of humanitarian lobby and partly the, um, uh, the work of um, uh, a British official named Philip, um, Philip Wodehouse, uh, who saw it as the British duty to protect uh, the Sutu, um, but he was just as concerned or maybe even more concerned about the uh, possibility that the Afrikaners would um, reach out to other European powers, even um, those who might be rivals with the British. Um, this is, you know, around the time when uh, the Germans were, for instance, um, beginning to form, be, to become united under Prus Prussian rule. Uh, this is close to, you know, I mean, 1870 sees the establishment of the Second Reich um, under the rule of the Kaiser. Uh, and so Bismarck um, was very active in politics at this point, right? And so there was a fear, uh, and, and Germany, moreover, um, was becoming the uh, industrial and economic powerhouse of continental Europe. Um, the British feared, given, you know, the, the sort of closer cultural and linguistic ties between Afrikaners and Germans, that that might be a potential alliance. Um, and so uh, they just, you know, for, for, num for any number of reasons, then uh, the British decide to annex, or rather to lay claim to um, most of the kingdom of Lesotho and to turn it into a British colony. Okay. Um, by the way, the Caledon River Valley um, was not part of this. They decided not to pick a fight with the Afrikaners. And so the Caledon River Valley fell under the auspices of the Orange Free State, it was really just this area up in the mountains here um, that became part of Basutu land colony. Um, and Mushwishwe had been reaching out to them uh, for a long time at this point, right? From the time the Afrikaners had begun to settle in and, and attack uh, Sutu positions in the Caledon River Valley, um, Mushwishwe, using his formidable diplomatic skills, had been trying to get the British to help them, uh, uh, even offering, you know, uh, offering up his kingdom as a, as a British, uh, a British colony, uh, with the calculus that the British would be less interested in, in, uh, taking territory from them and exploiting, uh, the Africans for their labor, enslaving them and things like that. And, and he was probably right uh, about that. Right. Um, uh, so, uh, Moshe Shwe, you know, was able to prevail upon Wodehouse ultimately, um, and he died only a couple of years after this, I think in 1870, um, at, a, at a ripe old age of, he's in his late 80s, I believe, um, Moshe Shwe, uh, died having, you know, achieved really incredible things, mostly diplomatically uh, over the course of his political career. Uh, he had outmaneuvered um, both the Afrikaners and the British uh, in numerous ways. Um, I, I neglected to mention in the 1850s, um, the... Uh, uh, there was a British general named George Cathcart uh, who um, d decided that uh, he needed to teach Moshe Shwe a lesson um, for really no other reason than feeling that Europeans were superior to Africans and the Moshe Shwe had outmaneuvered you know, Europeans and needed to be shown his place. And so he ordered his British soldiers to attack uh, Lesotho. Um, Moshe Shwe... Um, uh, really through just peace overtures, managed to convince Cathcart to leave without, uh, after just an initial foray into his land. Um, and, uh, you know, he succeeded in doing that, right? So Mishwishwe, as I said, is someone who needs, I think, to have more recognition uh, for the tremendous role he played in all of this. Okay, so that leaves us with something we can simply call colonial South Africa, right? Um, around 1870, this is what South Africa looks like. Uh, we have the Cape Colony down here. 
we have these independent Griqua land territories, Griqua land west, Griqua land east. Uh, we have the Africana republics of uh, Transvaal and the Orange Free States. Uh, we have then two British colonies, Natal and uh, Basutu land here. Uh, we also have, you know, independent kingdoms still under the control of the Africans like Zulu land and Swaziland and Matabele land up here. Um, uh, Botswana or Bechuana land, as the British called it, uh, was by this point a British protectorate. A protectorate is different from a colony. Uh, this meant that the natives were still, you know, f fully in charge of the government, but with accepting uh, European advisors. Um, and uh, really, Bas uh, Basutu land was more of a protectorate than a colony. The British were never terribly interested in direct administration of it. And so Mushwe and his heirs really were able to maintain some power there. Uh, even though it was called a colony, it really operated more as a protectorate. So that's what the map looks like. Now, uh, in 1870-71, um, diamonds were discovered um, right around the confluence of Griqualand West, the Orange Free State, and uh, the Northeastern Cape here. And this was going to change, this ended up changing South Africa forever. Um, and that's what we'll turn our attention to um, in the lectures coming up.